Hello everybody, my name is Farzan Ibadi and I am the Director of Social Media Governance Initiative at the A Law School. Today we are going to have a fireside chat with no fire uh, with Clint Smith from Discord. I uh, joined Discord two years ago after the loss of my friend because I was looking for a social media platform that was not so large, so I was seeking refuge. I am thrilled that after two years, they are still around and they are with us today to have a chat with us about their governance uh, mechanism. And also they want to, they have a global uh, vision and they want to build on that. And I am sure that the RightsCon community can contribute to that. Discord has a community governance uh, mechanism, which means that they are after building communities instead of just expanding their uh, user base and uh, their consumers, as well as they want to go beyond the um, San Francisco Bay borders and um, join the more global uh, governance landscape that we contribute to. So without Further ado, let, let's hear from um, Clint and let's have a fun and fireside uh, chat uh, with uh, Clint about Discord. So, Clint, just so that our audience uh, get to know you and I do not go over your biography and be boring, just tell us how does your day-to-day uh, -day job uh, uh, defines you as a person, but also as a leader in the tech corporation world. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for having me here. I'm so delighted to be here at RightsCon Farzana. Uh, in terms of my background, I'm currently the chief legal officer at Discord, but, but to know me, you should understand that I'm the son of a US diplomat. I was born in Spain. I've lived in Mexico, Peru, Romania, uh, Australia. And when I look at the agenda at this conference and the people here, uh, it really resonates with me as a global perspective and uh, so many civil society and human rights groups that are doing important work. And uh, as someone who has lived around the world and seen a military dictatorship in Peru and a communist dictatorship in Romania and our struggles with uh, democracy here in the United States, uh, it's very meaningful to, to see the topics and, and the people here. Uh, in terms of my, my uh, career track, I spent uh, many years in Washington, D.C. working on internet policy issues. I was uh, the chief lawyer for UUNet, one of the original internet backbones, dealing with content moderation topics around the world. And then I've been in Silicon Valley working for, for startups and uh, doing corporate law and M&A and IPOs. And uh, Discord is a wonderful combination of, of the two for me. Uh, and so at Discord, I have a legal team that works on contracts and patents and stock filings. But I also have a policy team that works on our product design, making sure our product has trust by design built into it, our platform policies, making sure that the rules, the community guidelines that apply to our platform uh, are clear and, and understood, and a trust and safety organization that's actually handling uh, reports on our platform uh, of bad behavior and also proactively looking uh, for, for harmful material. And then, um, in terms of being a, a leader, this is an important part of my job. Uh, as a leader at Discord, one thing I need to do is to go outside the walls of the company and bring back ideas. And the chance to connect with you, the chance to connect with other people uh, at RightsCon is an important part of my job to, to learn, to listen, to bring back ideas to Discord and uh, decide how we can uh, implement best practices and new approaches to the problems we're tackling. Great, thank you. So why did Discord even come about and how did you actually survive the dominance of big, large tech corporations? And what is the favorite aspect of Discord's business model for you? Yeah, yeah. So we just celebrated our sixth birthday uh, and our origins were in gaming. Our two founders, Jason and Stan, uh, they became friends through gaming. And uh, as they were growing up, they realized that uh, 
they really found a sense of belonging, a sense of community uh, among gamers. So they originally built a communications app so that gamers could communicate and uh, they could communicate by text messages, they could communicate by voice, and they could communicate by video like you and I are doing right now. Um, and it was built for gamers. What they found over time was that the pre-game, the post-game, the hanging out together was more important than the gaming itself. And really since 2019, we've been amazed by the broad uses of the platform. Uh, college clubs are using Discord, open source communities are using Discord, uh, artists and music communities are using Discord. And uh, we like to think of it as a place to, to come together and connect. And you get to decide whether you use the text message functionality, whether you use the voice or the video, and you get to decide whether you're communicating one-to-one -one or one-to-many. So we like to use the, the uh, metaphor of a neighborhood. And uh, in your neighborhood, you might have a very intimate one-to-one -one chat with a friend. You might have you know, 15 friends over for a dance party, or you might go out into a public space and listen to a live concert in the park with 20,000 people. And uh, Discord enables all of those modes of, of communication. And uh, we think that's you know, really special. Uh, one thing that drives us and, and differentiates us is a different model. We like to call ourselves a, a, you know, a new model of a social media platform. And that comes down to the fact that we don't sell advertising, and we don't sell data. And so our business model is to be paid directly by our users. And some percentage of our, our users, we have a free app and we have some paid features, and it's very transparent. We tell users, if you want certain features, you can pay us $5 a month or $10 a month, but it's a, a direct transaction between the users and us in a very transparent way. And that's really meaningful to us. And uh, um, you know, I, I'll share something from, from my personal life in the context of, of Discord. Uh, one of my daughters has type 1 diabetes, and if she were on Discord participating in a group around diabetes care or management or a diabetes cure, um, Discord doesn't track that, and Discord doesn't make that part of her profile on Discord, and, and it really alarms me and, and, and you know, uh, hurts me that on different platforms, you know, that might become part of her profile, her medical condition would become part of her profile that then would be sold to advertisers. And so I think this transparent model of a direct consumer subscription rather than profiling and ad targeting is a compelling new way of uh, monetizing a, a platform and a service like ours. Great. So you mentioned um, your uh, you have like neighborhoods and online neighborhoods, and this yeah. uh, sounds like a little bit like like con uh, community governance you have in place. So, and um, civil society is sometimes uh, skeptical about community governance because community leaders can become gatekeeper keepers, so they can become too friendly with you and become dictators <laughs> and either do yeah. what the corporations tell them or uh, do whatever they want. Um, can you tell the skeptics a thing or two about your governance mechanism? How do you actually control that? Not that you will convince us, but you know, <laughs> you can put us at ease. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have a strong conviction that community governance works because I see it work every day across so many different uh, Discord communities. But, but let me back up a little bit and talk about our approach to governance because uh, it has three tiers and it starts with the, the user and the product. So when you're using the Discord app, the user is in control. You decide who you communicate with. You decide the mode of communication. Is it voice or chat or text message? You decide which communities to join. And if the community is not working with you, we make it easy to start your own community and, and choose the people and, and the norms and behaviors that you want to operate by. So, so really our, our, our first approach to content moderation is putting the user first and putting a product in their hands that allows them to customize the experience to what they want that moment. Uh, and that's ex you know, exceedingly powerful. Um, the second part is our trust and safety team. So we have community guidelines, 18 paragraphs. They're very strong stands against hate, against groups that promote violence, uh, against harassment and fraud. And we do uh, you know, regulate our network to try to find examples of this. Uh, 
community guidelines being violated. And so, you know, my team, both in responding to user reports or responding to reports from trusted reporters in civil society, we take action, but we also proactively go out and uh, look for behavior that violates our community guidelines. And so uh, you start with the product and then you have our trust and safety team that applies these community guidelines to every behavior and every post on our platform. And then you have the community. And the beauty of, beauty of the community moderators is they can have local norms, local rules, and they can uh, really use you know peer influence to keep you in the community. And um, again, I'll, I'll invoke one of my children who's a, a college student in, in North Carolina. And I, I was thinking of, of her behavior during COVID and uh, behaving on a college campus is a hard thing to, to regulate. And there's you know federal guidance and state guidance and county guidance and school administrators. But, but if you talk to her about why she stayed in small groups, why she wore a mask, why she didn't go to big parties, it's because she didn't want to let the other students down. She knew that the school could get shut down and she's in her second year of university. And she said, I want the fourth year students, the seniors, to experience their final year of university. And I don't wanna be the one who causes all of us to get sent home. And that to me reflects the power of community moderation. It's a group that cares about each other, following norms and rules that they understand because they want that community to, to thrive and survive. And so uh, at Discord, um, we try to make the moderators effective in, in several different ways. Uh, in December of 2020, we launched our Discord Moderator Academy. That's an online curriculum of best practices on how to moderate on Discord. Uh, we have a suite of tools or, or bots that moderators can use to more effectively uh, keep their community healthy. And we have a certification and an exam so you can become a certified moderator with a special badge. But we invest a lot in the community moderators because we think that a member of the community enforcing local norms is going to be the best way of keeping our communities healthy and, and vibrant. And so I invite people to Discord and, and come talk to a moderator, take our moderator uh, academy exam, and uh, I think you'll see moderation uh, that works, and uh, we're, we're proud of it. Great. So, um, well, let's go now that we talked about uh, community governance, let's go to corporation governance and accountability and transparency is very important uh, uh, for civil society and other stakeholders in this uh, di digital space. And uh, uh, we are sometimes suspicious and frustrated by tech corporations, transparency reporting. It is usually uh, not actively at contributing to their policy changes and they drown us in a hundred pages of uh, transparency reports that are not, that they can't be even used or are not effective. So does, do you do this at Discord differently? Uh, we strive to do it differently. And I issue an open invitation to, to anyone at RightsCon to partner with us and help us have more useful uh, more impactful transparency reports. So every six months we issue a transparency report. And I want to dispel the myth that this is some, you know, mechanized process, at least at our company. Some of our very best employees, the, the most tenured employees, work hard at producing uh, this report. I'm in the Google Doc myself, so, so we'll report on January to June, and early July, I'll be in the Google Doc myself asking questions. Is there a better way to present this data? Are we making an assumption here, and do we need to double click and check that assumption? Uh, and we put a lot of care into it. Um, each time we've come out with this, we've tried to add a little bit more context and a little bit more information that'll be useful to the outside world. Um, I'll share uh, a few examples. Um, report before last, we started to report on recidivism. So we're very interested in the context of when to use a warning rather than an outright ban. And our colleague Eric Goldman in Santa Clara has done some excellent work on this. Of the different measures you can take, uh, we can put a server or community in quarantine. We can ban someone. We can give them a six hour timeout for bad behavior or a 30 day timeout for bad behavior. And so with experimenting with these uh, 
measures short of an outright ban, uh, we wanted to look at recidivism. And so if we gave you a warning for hate speech, how likely is it that we would ban you outright for hate speech within 12 months? Um, and I'm very proud of the team doing extra work to report on that very topic. And if it's of interest to people, we'll keep doing it. Uh, the second innovation we made uh, that I'm proud of the team for doing was giving more context on appeals. And so if you have action taken uh, against you by Discord, you have the right to appeal that action. And we're delighted when people do appeal because we can learn from that and we can also dialogue and, and educate our community. But we're so thoughtful about handling these appeals I asked, why don't we share more appeal information with the world? And so we took three of our appeals and we wrote up a case study. And we said, you know, in these two situations, this was the basis for the appeal. And this is why we did not overturn it. In this third situation, here was, you know, a legitimate researcher hanging out with an extremist group to study them. We banned everyone in that extremist community, including the researcher. The researcher came, shared their academic credentials, and it was a chance for education. Like, please don't hang out in these communities. Report them to us so we can rid discord of these communities. Don't be a passive lurker in the communities if you want to be a legitimate researcher. But it was a chance for dialogue. So uh, those were a couple of examples of how we're trying to advance the transparency report. For people at RightsCon, I want them to know that real humans who are trying to do the right thing are behind these reports and that these reports are dynamic. If there are things you want to know about with respect to Discord moderation, Discord trust and safety, Discord policy enforcement, tell us and we will do our best to get that into a future iteration of the transparency report. We welcome the feedback and we want to do better. Great, thank you. So um, a lot of yeah, these are great things and they're very hopeful. And But when corporate tech corporations go global, they kind of copy each other's governance system because that is more convenient and perhaps um, and more efficient. If and when you go uh, global, are you going, what sort of changes are you going to make? Do you know that are you going to change your approach? What if your network is like a like a billion people? Um, what is going to change? Yeah, yeah. So currently we have a 150 million monthly active users. Uh, that's doubled in the last year. And 79% of those active users are outside the United States. Uh, you know, we as a Discord leadership team realize that, you know, 98% of our employees are in the United States, but 79% of our users are outside the United States. We need to uh, become very effective at understanding the, the cultures and the norms and the languages of uh, the rest of the world. And, and we're working on that as a young company. Um, the first place we go is other companies. And I do have to say that in the realm of trust and safety, other companies are incredibly generous with their time and their best practices. So when I joined Discord nine months ago, uh, I immediately connected with colleagues at Verizon and at Microsoft and at Snap and at Twitter uh, and at Google. And these people are incredibly generous with their time and sharing their stories of the struggles they faced as they expanded around the world and, uh, and how we could learn from that. And I am grateful for these other companies that are larger than us helping a smaller company in the interest of common safety. Why would you help someone who is potentially a competitor? Because fundamentally, these companies do care about safety uh, and we connect all the time. Then they uh, helped us understand what groups to use. And I'll talk about a few different groups that have been valuable to us. Uh, in the realm of um, violent extremism and, and hate groups uh, and terrorism. Uh, we're members of, of GIFCT, we're members of Tech Against Terrorism. Uh, we'll be joining the Christchurch call and incredible learnings to be had by being in those discussions and, and with those uh, organizations. When it comes to sexual exploitation and, and child safety, uh, we work closely with NICMIC and ICMIC. Uh, we're uh, members of the Tech Coalition and also the, the Family Online Safety Institute. And again, there's such deep expertise about protecting children and keeping uh, teens safe online. Uh, and we definitely um, uh, benefit from that. 
And then lastly, two more horizontal uh, organizations. The Digital Trust and Safety Partnership is a coalition of companies, some of the giants like Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, some of the mid-sized companies like Discord and Reddit and, and Pinterest. And we come together to come up with best practices on content moderation. And then lastly, the Trust and Safety Professionals Association uh, that launched last year, incredibly valuable for a company like Discord to send our employees to events put on by really the leading figures in uh, online governance and, and content moderation. And one thing I love about the Trust and Safety Professionals Association, uh, when I asked them, what about the employees of some outsourcers that we use for you know, low complexity, low harm reports? Can they come to your meetings? And they said, absolutely. If you have outsourcers in uh, different countries who are working on you know, trust and safety matters for Discord, they are welcome at our events, just as your employees would be. And I think that's great. That's in the spirit of we all need to, to get better at this. Um, I would say you know, one area where we don't have enough contacts is academics and civil society groups outside North America. So uh, one reason I'm here at RightsCon and, and Discord as a sponsor of RightsCon is we're eager to make connections with civil society groups and, and academics outside North America. We have so much to learn from the work you're doing and uh, we're committed to that and being here is part of that. Thank you so much. So um, it's great that you mentioned the participation of academics because, um, uh, you know, cooperation with tech corporations is, is very good, but also um, uh, we would be delighted if you come up with your own creative methods for governance and uh, and kind of like improve upon them, which I can see that at this court that is about to happen. but. Um, so there is a word that we use now that we are talking about stakeholders. There is a word that we use at RightsCon and other venues, and it's uh, it's called like multi-stakeholder governance. Yep. Um, it's a governance system. It has, uh, in my opinion, it has kind of lost its meaning, and uh, and. Uh, well, we have disagreements over the definition as well. Do you find the meaning, uh, do you find this multi-stakeholder governance meaningful? Um, do you think there is a way out of like this de a complex definition? Can you change our mind about multi-stakeholder? What are your plans to just include all of these stakeholders that have conflicting opinions and make the world better? Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you raised this. And, and I would say, first off, you, know, you understand this topic much better than I do. And, and you are an expert in, in you know, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, systems and, and how they've worked and how they've failed. So, so I won't profess to be an expert there. Uh, where I come from is a multi-stakeholder approach is, is central to the role of a chief legal officer of a tech company. When you think about it, you know, I have stockholders who've invested in my company. Uh, I have employees, I have members of the management team. I have, uh, you know, users of our product. I have sponsoring corporations in our case, like a Sony or Spotify who integrate with our product. Uh, and then I have uh, outside groups like, you know, regulators uh, in different countries who care about what we're doing. So in effect, you know, my job is, is a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, every day at work, I'm thinking about um, how are we serving the employees? How are we serving our users? How are we uh, being mindful of the regulators? How can we help, you know, a professor at Carnegie Mellon advance her research? And so uh, by definition, it's a multi-stakeholder role. Um, so when I think about multi-stakeholder uh, organizations, um, I really hope they can be successful and I hope they can be structured in a way so that all the relevant uh, groups have voices and have impact. And uh, the way I think about it um, is not that, you know, it's a binary, it's, it's failed or it's succeeded. It's really a question for, for us as participants in this movement to ask, with each of our decisions, with each of our actions, are we advancing a multi-stakeholder approach? Are we detracting from it? 
So, so when we create an organization, when we organize a conference, when we decide where to spend our money and where to spend our time, are we advancing a multi-stakeholder approach? Or are we cutting people out? Uh, and so that's the way I approach it. So, so each day uh, I look for opportunities to embrace a multi-stakeholder uh, ethos. And I think by joining events like this, you know, I could be reading a patent or I could be writing a stock document, uh, but I'm here at RightsCon and meeting people. And uh, I think that's endorsement of, of the multi-stakeholder approach. So I don't think we should give up on it. I think there's promise there and there's not just promise. I, I think it's something that if we work at, we can help it fulfill its potential. Okay, wonderful. So we have received some questions, but I'm going to ask you this last question that I have, and uh, then we can go to the uh, audience. So imagine a world without Facebook or any other apps. Now imagine Discord was the only tech platform that people were uh, using in the world, and um, so how do you how, how can you imagine your role now? Imagine you were a monopoly. What would mm. you do? Mm. <laughs> that might be the most interesting question I've had in in, in many years. Uh, let me think about that. Well, so as a as a starting place, I'm a little bit sad because at least within my own family, you know, on a given day, we'll laugh looking at some TikTok videos, or if there's important news, we're following it on Twitter. Uh, and I think the different apps we use, they're all useful for something different. And Discord is great for connecting with the people and communities you care about, but it's not a news reader. <laughs> you know? And, and so, so I, I think one, I'd partly be sad because uh, there's so many rich apps out there that are innovating each week and, and making our you know, life more, more meaningful. Uh, but if it had to be Discord, um, I guess I'm, I'm thankful for certain things about Discord, the product. I'm thankful that we have, you know, chat, voice, and video, and you get to decide which one to use. Uh, I'm thankful that it's good for one-on-one -on -one conversations, and it's good for, you know, 100,000 people to come together for an event. Um, I'm glad that we're cross-platform, and so we really aim to be useful on, on every device and on every operating system. I'm glad that we invest in uh, supporting multiple languages and accessibility for people who are vision impaired and, and hearing impaired. And so uh, I guess I'm glad that if it has to be one app, uh, it's Discord, um, because I think we offer uh, a lot uh, that is uh, you know, positive for, for bringing belonging and community to the world. Um, I guess to your point of, you know, the monopoly, it's a fascinating jumping off point for, for the connection between content moderation and competition law. And uh, I think that's such a rich area to explore. Uh, I think a lot about common carrier regulation. At what point do these platforms become so essential? They're like our electricity, like our water, like our sewer system. Uh, and what does that mean for, for us as creators and, and users of these platforms if, if governments begin to see us as common carriers? Will there be less innovation? Will there be less customer service? Will there be tighter alignment between the regulated common carrier and the government? Uh, will there be a, a level of conservatism that doesn't exist uh, today in the management uh, of these utilities. And so uh, it's a good jumping off point. There are people who are uh, much brighter minds than mine grappling with this issue of, uh, uh, you know, common carrier regulation and, and what that would mean. But I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, just to pick on that a little bit. Um, so what would you do because you'd be the most powerful and you would not have any competition? Are you, uh, what, how are you going to treat the stakeholders? Because now you're here and uh, we have a role in <laughs> making your life a bit difficult or easier. And it's great that you're here, but how are you going to go, what is going to be the approach towards this external stakeholders? Yeah, I, the stakeholder uh, relationships would be of, of the highest importance, uh, but so would the, the user 
relationships. And so listening to our users in terms of, of what they wanted from us uh, would be incredibly important because we would have the obligation uh, to serve them no matter what. And so uh, I think yeah, that that would be our focus. Um, okay, let's uh, go to the audience uh, question. One of the questions asks that does the proactive, what does the proactive moderation by the trust and safety team look like? Does Discord use tools to review posts pre-upload or post-upload? Is this um, machine learning assistant? And this is a very important question that in our community we are very worried about uh, about automation of uh, takedowns as well as upload filters. So um, this is a ver very good question that can be challenging. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad this question came in because uh, our proactive work, uh, first, it's primarily focused on the highest harm areas. So it's focused on you know violent extremism and, and sexual exploitation. Um, it is based on machine learning and that you know we use machine learning algorithms to detect possibly troubling activity, but then it results in human review. So so we aren't automatically taking action based upon the machine learning results. It almost comes up with a, a, a queue of um, communities or individuals that require further uh, assessment by a human. And those are humans working at Discord, um, not uh, outsourced employees. They're humans uh, on my trust and safety team who follow up on the uh, uh, leads, so to speak, that were generated by the machine learning algorithm. So if you look at our transparency report from, from last fall, I was really pleased to see that on violent extremism, we were taking down two times as many communities with proactive measures than with reactive. And, and that was a real source of pride for, for our team that the machine learning detected an issue. We investigated and confirmed that it was an extremist group or a hate group, and we removed the community from Discord proactively before anyone complained. And uh, that was a source of pride for us. The, you know, hate has no place on Discord, and if we can find it before someone reports it, that's even better. Uh, but yes, there's machine learning, but it's always combined with human review to understand the context. Uh, the machine learning, for instance, sometimes will find something that is satire, uh, and the human will realize, aha, you know, they're making fun of a certain group. Uh, we're not going to delete it, but we might give them some advice to tone it down uh, so that they don't get detected next time by the machine learning. Uh, that's great. Uh, so this goes back to how you actually define um, trust and safety, two terms that are very loaded in a way. <laughs> but, and, um, but also when you talk about machine learning and uh, we, we discuss a lot the concept of fairness and how do you how do you uh, manage to do you define fairness in uh, your uh, machine learning if you use machine learning do you define fairness before actually add the design of the product mm -hmm. itself uh, so, so at this uh, point in time we're using very general machine learning algorithms you know primarily open source algorithms to spot things that could be problematic uh, we still very much engage in in human review by our trust and safety team because context is so important. There's so many situations that we debate within our own trust and safety team because the context is nuanced. And um, one reason we want to engage more with civil society groups and academics is to bring more uh, nuance to those decisions. And so people should know that on the, the delicate decisions we make, they're being made by humans, and those humans are you know, studying academic literature, getting training through industry organizations, and really trying to make the best judgment in the moment uh, based on all the context that they can capture. Um, so I'm going to ask a difficult question, and I know it's difficult and there is never <laughs> one answer to it. And when you talk about stakeholder engagement, uh, sometimes in some tech corporations, we see that they pick and choose. 
uh, who they want to, uh, because of course the volume of um, when you issue a public comment, if like there's like 3,000 uh, comments and uh, you don't know how to actually manage that, you don't have the resources. But when you, uh, how do you have a way that we can make it better so that you don't pick and choose with which, uh, Com which academics and civil society organizations you go to and be more inclusive? Mm. You know, we would love guidance on this. So, you know, we are so small right now. We are 350 employees. I mentioned we're almost all in North America. We're at the very early stages of this company. We want to do it right. We want to take multi-stakeholder feedback into the decisions we make. So you know, we invite people to tell us how to do it right. We haven't had the problem yet of, of picking and choosing because we have so few external relationships. And so uh, we want to build those relationships. Uh, one thing we can do is we know there are certain uh, you know, parts of the world, certain uh, vulnerable communities that, that can be targeted that are finding that Discord is a good place to, to join and build community and, and communicate. And so maybe that's one way we start filtering is saying, oh, we have a very active group of users in this country, or we have a um, you know thriving set of communities from this one uh, group that's vulnerable. Uh, let's focus there. So, so to the extent we focus, I think we'll follow the lead of, of our users and say, uh, where are our users? Where are they from? What communities do they represent? And let's make sure we're building relationships with stakeholders that are strong representatives of those communities uh, who are finding uh, belonging and meaning on Discord. Oh, that's a very good segue to another um, participant question, which is very important. And uh, um, normally in our uh, discussions with uh, tech corporations, they focus a lot on um, taking down and penalty and uh, uh, and you know this this is their solution to the problem of to the behavioral problem that um, they face on their platform, and some of us don't think that is enough. Um, the question is, so when you mitigate harm, what do you do actually for repairing harms? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that is a uh, an important topic, and it's one where I think. The, the community moderators will often be more skilled than the Discord staff because the Discord staff that might be making a decision, they're not a member of the community that has experienced the harm, whereas the community moderators who are inside that community uh, have probably you know witnessed and seen the effects of that harm and are in a better position to, to provide the healing. Um, we do, you know, give a lot of thought to this question of when are the scenarios that an outright ban is necessary? You know, behavior is so troubling and so offensive and so harmful that we will go to great technical means to make sure that person never registers again for Discord, no matter, you know, what device they're on, no, no matter what, you know, email or phone number they use, we will try to keep them off our platform. There, there are certain things, you know, around sexual exploitation or non-consensual pornography where they're so offensive and hateful, we're going to stop it uh, no matter what. There are a lot of other scenarios where there's a chance for education. Uh, we want to provide belonging in people's lives. We want to provide communities where they can be accepted and understood and heard. And if we think there's a scenario where someone can be pulled aside and, and warned and educated about what it means to be a positive force in a community, um, we're going to look for that because fundamentally we want to bring people together. Uh, and so we look for opportunities to find measures short of an outside ban when we believe someone can, can be uh, a good member of a community. We want them back. Great. Uh, so when we talk about like repairing harm, uh, we see the uh, attacker, but also we see the uh, survivor. Um, how do you? What do you think the role of the survivor here is? So how can you, like you know, remedy the harm considering and putting in center the uh, actual victim here? Yeah. Um, so so you know, when you come back to 
the the product design you know putting the user first so that they can you know block people who have harmed them or block people who are allied with the someone who has harmed them uh second you know there are communities that you can join or leave and if you find that you know a community is aligned with someone who attacked you you know you leave that community and you start a positive one. So, so I do think it comes back to product design and, and putting uh, the person who has suffered the harm uh, you know, in charge of their experience on our platform, in charge of who they engage with and in what mode, and um, that's central to, to making Discord successful for them. Wonderful. So I have a uh, kind of long question that I would like to read it out because it's, okay. I think it's important. <laughs> So um, they're asking at the beginning of the year, I read how Discord was helping the this channel Wall Street Bet team moderate its server after temporarily banning the group. Curious if you've considered whether offloading CM to users content moderation to users increased the likelihood of rules violations. And if it does, um, should companies take a proactive direct approach earlier in the game when the problematic content is reported and perhaps a bit of what uh, what did you learn from that experience and yeah. which leads to the next question which is more user that as there are more users at discord is the plat uh, platform capable of stepping in before the point a ban is necessary Right. Sorry, too many questions. I thought I would die. No, no. And, uh, uh, and just to put things into context, we, we have 19 million communities on Discord today for our 150 million active users. So the idea that you know our staff will be moderating all 19 million communities uh, is just not uh, going to be feasible, which is the power of communities you know moderating themselves uh, until uh, they need our help. Um, let me speak to Wall Street bets because that was fascinating, and uh, there was a lot of you know coverage in the media or statements by by politicians that uh, were not accurate. There was some excellent reporting from The Verge, so uh, a shout out to our colleagues at The Verge who I think got the story right. Um, but the Wall Street bets server had been uh, warned multiple times for uh, you know hateful speech that was not being moderated. There was, uh, you know, uh, racist speech, anti-LGBTQIA speech, and the server had been warned about uh, this offensive content that violated our community guidelines. And so when there was, you know, additional uh, uh, speech that violated this in February, we took them offline. Uh, this is all in the context of personal investing. That is a wonderful topic to discuss on Discord. You know, so many people care about personal investing. So many people care about, you know, being involved in the stock market and, and where to put their money. Uh, that's the type of community that thrives on Discord and we want it. So what uh, happened there was uh, we worked with the forces in the community who wanted to do the right thing to relaunch like a like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Uh, Wall Street Bets relaunched with moderation bots with proper roles and permissions, with you know filters for offensive language, and by just putting in a couple of days of work by some you know heroic Discord employees with some uh, Wall Street bets organizers who wanted to do the right thing, we think the community you know is back on good footing. But to me, that was a, a success story where we held our ground on our standards and our principles, and we took it offline because they didn't respond to warnings, uh, but because there were people who wanted to bring the community back along proper uh, rules and following our community guidelines, we helped them and now it's a thriving community. So um, we can't have Discord employees full-time moderating every community, but when there's a useful topic like personal investing and people are finding value from that community, uh, we can help them moderate it better. And oftentimes that's helping them configure the community with the right bots and the right rules and the right roles and permissions to, to ensure future successful moderation of that community. So uh, there's a lot of press on a lot of topics relating to, to Wall Street bets, but I think in our small part of the story, uh, we stuck by our principles uh, and the server came down, uh, but because we're believers in 
people sharing information about personal investing. Uh, we allowed uh, a group to, to reorganize, restructure, and come back in a way that's healthy. Great. So um, we, we see that a lot of the uh, many products um, and databases are built before these platforms become like large. And as a result of a bad design, we see a lot of consequences of, uh, you know, later on when you have many, many users, which uh, is going back to that question, can you actually, um, are you, are you uh, in the long term, are you looking in the long term, what sort of uh, effect your, the design of your product might have and what are the, um, what are the reference, what are you considering? And, and you're asking a question specifically around uh, the user data we collect and, and how it's stored? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, our product is, is designed to, to scale. And so I'm not sure we have to change our fundamental architecture as we grow from 150 million to 250 million to a billion users. Uh, uh, our, our expectation is the infrastructure and the architecture should stay the same. Um, at present, uh, all of our data is stored in the United States on a major cloud service. And so that will be an interesting question as we continue to expand abroad. Uh, the fact that a you know user in Turkey who's communicating with a you know user in France uh, those direct messages are stored in the United States. Uh, you know, will create uh, interesting issues, um, but for now, uh, the data is stored in the cloud in the United States, and that architecture, you know, works for us. Um, and no, no immediate plans to change that. Great, thank you. So uh, before I go to the next question, I actually forgot to ask our community members in the beginning to actually put their questions in the chat. It's a fireside conversation, and so you are you should all be joining. Um, so the next question, but uh, don't worry, our community asks questions <laughs> so, <laughs> without me asking. Uh, does this court engage with Congress or state houses on yeah. tech issues like content moderation, Section 230, or privacy? If so, what does this court think on those issues? And if not, do you plan to in the future? Yes, it's absolutely important for Discord to have a voice on public policy issues, uh, you know, not just in Washington, but in all the countries in which we have users and, and the opportunity to, to advocate for them and their rights. Uh, with respect to, to Washington in particular, uh, we are strong proponents of a federal privacy law. We think that uh, the United States should have a strong, consistent protection of personal data, uh, similar to GDPR. Uh, of course, there'd be some, you know, U.S. changes to it, but we think uh, uniform and strong rules modeled on a European standard are a positive thing for our users and for our industry. Um, on Section 230, we're we're open-minded. The law is 25 years old. Uh, we think it has enabled you know, innovation and a you know huge amount of, of user benefit in terms of the technology that's been developed, but we also acknowledge it's 25 years old and then, you know, you wouldn't feel the safest in a 25 year old car hurtling down the highway. Uh, so we are open to, to changes to, to Section 230 uh, that would modernize it. And uh, we're definitely part of, of that process. We're part of different um, coalition groups in, in Washington, D.C. that that are looking at Section 230 reform. Absolutely. Oh, wow, you are advocating for a GDPR style privacy federal law in the US that, that makes our privacy activists very happy um, because it, it can be a very um, yeah. <laughs> difficult oh. law to actually implement, but um, that's great. Yeah, but could come back to our, our very first question in terms of the business model that differentiates us. Uh, we don't make money from selling advertising. We don't sell personal data. Uh, if you know we're going to earn money, we're going to earn money directly from our users in a transparent way where you get A, B, and C for this much money. Um, and 
we feel, you know, if we had a federal privacy law that gave people more trust that their digital privacy would be protected, uh, they'll spend more time using products like Discord, and uh, that's a positive for us. And so uh, we would love a federal standard that generates more trust in, in products like ours. And we also just want to drive home this point about our business model where uh, the data we collect is used to provide you a better service, but that data is not sold and it doesn't become part of your advertising profile that makes you the product uh, rather than you know the communication service being the product. Uh, just to pick on that um, business model, um, yeah. which is uh, which is great not to use um, the users as a product. And as I said uh, in the beginning, I think this court has a community-based uh, vision, uh, other than the just like solely on individual uh, focusing on individual uh, people. However, there is a there is a problem with the business model that has to charge. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we uh, usually kind of disregard that, but if you want to go global, you might not be able to provide your services if you charge to certain countries that can actually uh, benefit. Like for example, you bring them, they are under sanction, but you bring yeah. them freedom of expression. They can feel comfortable on discussing things on your uh, platform. Uh, so how do you actually balance that? Yeah. It, yeah. That to me is is one of our most important obligations as members of the Discord leadership team, where we want to have a robust free product as we do today that has you know full capability around voice and video and creating a community and managing a community. Um, at the same time, you know we are a corporation and uh, we do need to uh, you know make money and pay our employees and continue to to innovate and so. The, the magic will be, f you know, finding those features that are, you know, are extras uh, that don't take away from the core communications capability, uh, but which some people will value. And so uh, the, the, the work uh, will continue, but some of the features we have, so for instance, you know, maybe a, a larger file upload. If you're really into digital photography and you want to share, you know, enormous images with your photographer friends on Discord. That has a real cost for Discord in terms of our storage and our cloud bill. So, so for people like that, if you're really into digital photography and you want to share your best images with a lot of your friends, there may be a $5 fee for large file uploads. Uh, same thing, if you really want to personalize your experience and have you know, uh, a fun username and have you know, custom emoji that are your you know, personal emoji um, or your you know, avatar changing, um, hey, maybe you'll pay us five dollars a month for that. So, so, so the things we charge for, uh, we think, will be around personalization or some enhanced level of service for something like a digital photographer, where you really need something extra that the the regular user uh, won't won't need. So, so that'll be our challenge to to find enough exciting features that people will pay for, so that we can continue to run the service, continue to innovate, and continue to add users around the world. Uh, but we value the free users just as much as we do the ones who pay us. Great. Now that we are talking about privacy, one last question, as I promise. Um, so what do you do with encryption? Do you actually have any opinion about it or do you yeah. use it in your platform? I'm so glad this question came up because this was one of the things that I wanted to cover today just to, to educate the audience. So we have strong security on Discord with respect to messages in transit, but you know, messages on the platform are you know, available in, in clear text uh, for you know, our company, and we don't have end-to-end -end encryption the way that many other uh, products do. And so if you are someone where secrecy is paramount, if your you know if your life or you know your your personal affairs are dependent upon you know absolute security, there are better products for you that have end-to-end -end encryption uh, you know architected into them, uh, and you should be using those products. And so there's certainly cer you know certain circumstances in life where you need that absolute secrecy. 
uh, and Discord doesn't provide that. So uh, there will be situations, whether it's for our own trust and safety investigations or in response to uh, a law enforcement request um, or government you know, request, that we will look at the plain text of communication. So uh, we're about communities and bringing people together, but we are not about absolute secrecy. And so if that's your priority, we're not the right communications tool for you. Great, that was a very honest and great answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to say my product. Some of you might not be able to use my product. So thank you for that. And uh, we have, the, uh, there is this um, very important question that I have been mentioning and you've covered most of it, but I, I do like to um, get your opinion uh, on it again. So the audience is asking, how do you address communities that use the platform to create harm? Yeah. For example, white supremacists, misogynists, and those that engage in anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, to just use the platform to create, cause pain for others. Yeah, yeah. You know, we do not allow hate on Discord. Our community guidelines, you know, clearly uh, prohibit uh, hateful messages, hateful groups from organizing on Discord. And we put, you know, enormous resources at detecting these groups and and removing them and and detecting the messages and and removing them so it really is one of our our highest priorities and uh, we welcome working uh, with experts in the community who can help us identify these groups before they create harm so so one program i wanted to mention that uh, is just getting off the ground is our trusted reporter program so you're if you're an expert at tracking hate groups if you're an expert at you know violent extremist groups and how they organize and where they organize uh, we welcome you to partner with us uh, we have a trusted reporter program where when you identify that one of those groups is becoming active on discord we will put your report to the top of our queue and, and treat it uh, very quickly and very confidently because um, we know there are people who understand these groups better than we do. And if you can help us identify them on Discord, we will remove them. So we're, we're actively enrolling uh, trusted reporters who can help us find hate groups and extremist groups and get them off our platform. I really don't want to pick this question again, but then when you um, when you talk about, and we are uh, at the end of the session anyway, but when you talk about detecting these uh, groups, uh, they have dif uh, everybody had different definition for terrorism and hate speech. Um, do you have any plan to kind of like bring a, uh, some kind of moderate approach that we don't see in other platforms? Yeah, so the the best information on on this would be we just recently did a blog post uh, written one by one of our best experts on our staff around extremism and, and hate groups and and how we define them and the actions we take so the the discord policy blog uh, is is up and running and uh, uh, the first post was you know welcome to the discord policy blog and the very next post was the work we do uh, on hate groups and extremist groups and and the resources we bring to bear to remove those groups from our platform so um, I have such high respect for the group at Discord that, that works on this, and I think you know, what they do is best described in, in that blog post. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes to the end of this session, so I'm going to um, let you breathe and not ask difficult questions. But um, so just tell our community to talk to our community, and uh, you know you're very welcome, and uh, we are glad that you're here. But if you have any message for them, and you're a part of it now, so there's no way out. But if you have any message for them, you're welcome. You know, Discord is, is so thankful to be here. We come here with a learner mindset. We're 350 people uh, and we're supporting a, a large community of users around the world. Uh, we want to keep the dialogue open. We welcome input on how we should do our content moderation, what we should share with you in our transparency reports. And we hope to be back at RightsCon every year you know, continuing the dialogue and deepening the dialogue. That would be my message.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Clint, for your time and welcome to RightsCon community. We will be watching you uh, thrive, but also we will be watching you. So, you know, <laughs> and we will uh, we will provide a feedback and uh, we are very happy that, uh, well, uh, community really likes to um, be included in decision making and we look forward to working with you. Absolutely. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Take care.